Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Friday night uh, lecture uh, with Malam Haider Shirazi. I will request uh, Brother Mohsen uh, Ladakh to start with the recitation of Holy Quran. Well, Muhammad Wali Muhammad Salawa. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسمك ال... باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم كلا إن الإنسان ليطغى أرآه استغنى إن إلى ربك الرجعى أرأيت الذي ينهى عبدا إذا صلى أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى أرأيت إن كذب وتولى ألم يعلم بأن الله يرى كلا لئن لم ينتهي لنسفعا بالناصية ناصية كاذبة خاطئة فليدع ناديه سندع الزبانية كلا لا تطعه واسجد واقترب صدق الله العلي العظيم الوات Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank you, Brother Mohsen, for that beautiful recitation of the Holy Quran. I wanted to say assalamu alaikum to everyone who's attended this program today on the second series lecture of Adab al Salat. Just a few updates. The programs for the rest of the week is as follows. And there will be a program tomorrow, Saturday night, for Ayame Fatamiya. The program will start at 7.30 with the recitation of Holy Quran. Then it will be Sol Salam in Marcia. And then we will be having Sheikh Bilal Hussain give a majlis in English. The program will end with Noha and Ziyarat. The same schedule will be as follows for Sunday night, the 17th. We will have an Urdu majlis with being blessed with reciters from outside of the country for Sol Salam and Marcia and Noha. And we will be blessed by Mulana Ghulam Raza Rouhani from Pakistan. We'd like to ask everyone to attend those, those programs. Now we'd like to continue on with the program. I would like to introduce Mulana Sheikh Heather Shirazi from Vancouver. He's one of our esteemed scholars and one of our beloved scholars. He's familiar to moment and we all love his speeches. We have loved him for many, many years and we're blessed to have him again. And he will be covering the second lecture in this series of seminars based on the intellectual compilation of the book, adab -e salat the Discipline of Prayer, created and made by Imam Khomeini. So I'd like to invite Sheikh Heather Shazi with a loud salawat. Muhammad Muhammad وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأنجبين بهم نتولى ومن أعدائهم نتبرأ إلى الله اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة 
وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توغا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم صل على محمد اللهم صل على محمد الحمد لله Now before we get on to the topic and that is on adab al salat just a reminder to every one of you and this is the surah that was recited before the start of the session it was surah alaq and it has a wajib sajda so well it's good to recite it's the first surah that was revealed upon rasulullah sallallahu alaihi but the last ayah that was recited, it has a wajib sajda. And whoever listens to it live must perform a sajda. That is wajib fawri. And you have to do it immediately. That is when you hear the sajda that was recited live by a person on live or in person in a majlis, that is the ruling of all of the mujtahideen that you have to bow down in sajda. If you cannot perform a full sajda, then you just bow down uh, in ishara or just as if uh, you have performed a sajda. So that is wajib. So either you don't recite that ayah which has that wajib sajda, or if you want to recite, inform others that this has a wajib sajda and everyone must bow down in sajda when they hear that ayah. So that is wajib. Now reciting these surahs that have a wajib sajda, it is not permitted to recite in the prayers in sanat. So Surah Al-Alaq, we are not allowed to recite in our prayers. In, so that is also another ruling that we have. With reference to these surahs that have wajib sajdas, that are, they have, uh, there are special rules. For example, in the state of Janabat, it is forbidden to recite. Over here also, the ruling of the uh, ulama also, it's different. Uh, the ruling of the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, ulama also it's different over here for example Imam Khomeini is of the opinion that uh, is of the opinion that you cannot recite any part of that surah uh, whilst in the state of Janabat even the Bismillah well Ayatollah Khamenei and Ayatollah Al-Uzma Sistani they are of the opinion that it's only that ayah uh, which has the wajib sajda you are not allowed to recite well this is the ruling that we have for surahs that I have wajib sajda there are four surahs, Surah Al-Alaq, Surah Al-Najm, Surah Hamim Fussilat, and Surah Sajda. These are the four surahs that have a wajib sajda. So keep that in mind. Either you don't recite these ayat that have a wajib sajda, or if you do recite, inform the, the audience to perform a sajda, and that is wajib. Returning to our talk, and that is the etiquettes and adab of salats. Now, Allah, wa ta'ala, he has created us uh, he has given us a form. The reality and the haqiqat of man's creation is his ruh, is his soul. That is the asl. So this soul he created, it was the same soul which was in the womb of our mothers. It was the same soul prior to that. That is when Allah Taala created Prophet Adam and then the zarrat or all the creation, the men the, that are supposed to come until the last day of this planet Earth, all of them were created once, that their souls were created. Now, this body that he has given to us, it's a temporary, it's a body that is only for this world that we are in. Prior to this, this soul had another carriage, another body. Now it is in the form of this human body. And once we die and we arrive in Barzakh, the same soul will be there. And then another body, much more sophisticated, will be given in Barzakh. And after that, when we rise for the Day of Judgment, and after giving account, and when we enter the heaven, inshallah, again, another body, much more, far more sophisticated, will be given to us. So the origin or the original or the reality of man, it's the ruh, it's the soul that he has given to us. So we have two dimensions, a material dimension, which is the body, and we have a spiritual dimension, which is the ruh. Likewise, the salat also that we are offering, it has two dimensions. It has a zahir, which, has, which is the exterior or the shell of the prayer, and it has a batin, which is the interior of the prayer. Like the batin of me is my soul, and the zahir of me is my body, Salat also, it has a zahir, it has a batin. 
So all of these haqaiq that Allah Ta'ala, has created for us, for example, Sirat. Sirat, it's that bridge that will be placed in the Akhirah, which is sharper than a sword and finer than hair. That Sirat, what purpose is that going to serve? If it's a bridge that's sharp and that narrow, how can anyone pass on that bridge? Now then we see that Allah says there is a Sirat there. So get, to get familiar with that Sirat in the Akhirah, you have to familiarize yourself with a Sirat in this dunya. Then says, we have a father who is our biological father and a mother. Likewise, we have a father who is Rasulullah and Amirul Mu'mineen, who are the fathers of this nation. So for us to be obedient to that father that is Rasulullah and Amirul Mu'mineen, we have to be obedient to our father, that biological father who gave birth to us. So a father, to be obedient to him, we have to be obedient to this father here. That sirat in the akhirah, if you want to be successful and be able to pass on that sirat, we have to have a replica of that sirat in this dunya. And that sirat, it is Amirul Mu'mineen and the Imams, alayhim as salam, as said by the Prophet, that sirat al that we have in the Quran, when inquired, he says that Ali was Siratul Mustaqim. Ali is Siratul Mustaqim. Likewise, the balance, smizan, the scale. So if there is a scale in the Akhirah that we have to familiarize with, so there should be a scale here that could be, that could inform us, tell us that what that mizan is, what that scale is. So that scale also is the Imam. That Sirat is also the Imam. So everything that we have throughout this entire creation in this field of spirituality and learning and all the adab that we have, we all, they, all of them, they have two dimensions. There is a spiritual dimension, which is, which is the inner or the core or the bottom of that, uh, of that worship. And there is a zahir of it, which is the shell, that is the salat that we offer. Now the salat that, uh, that a person who was fit and well, he offers, he offers. I mean, if that person is not fit and well, he cannot stand, he sits and offers. If he cannot, he lies down and offers. And many a times you see that people, they are on the, in, the uh, in the stretchers, or even if it is time for prayers, they are occupied in worship. Although the body is not uh, moving, but then the shell of the prayer, for that person is going to be different, for me it's going to be different, for another person is going to be different. So there is a zahir of the prayer, which is the shell, and there is a button of this prayer, which is the core. So spirituality and the material form also, it's the same. Now in the Akhirah, Allah wa ta'ala, he says that, وَوَجَدُوا مَا amilu حَاذِرًا Whatever you have done, you would see that it is present and it is evident before you. حَاذِرًا so whatever I do is going to be present. So actions also will take a form. Whatever I have done, good or bad, it will be evident and it will appear in a form. If it's the good, in a good form. If it's the bad, in a bad form. So adab of the prayer also, they are the same, similar. For example, in the in there is a hadith al-Qudsi. There the Almighty says, now to understand this hadith, uh, if we have neighbors, and if I don't speak to my neighbor properly, I go to him, I'm looking at the other side and I'm speaking to my neighbor here. And my attention is not towards him. He will get offended and he won't even talk to me because that is that disrespect I'm showing to him. Now then compare that with the existence of Allah Taala, that I stand in worship before him and my attention is not towards him. That is that height of disrespect and height of uh, 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 and the, that adab which is not being observed over here. Hadith says that someone who stands in worship before Allah wa and his thoughts and his attention and his mood, it is all wandering around. Does he not fear that I can change him into a donkey? That is this action of not being present before Allah in prayers is such bad that he, the creator, 
if he intends, if he wants, if he wishes, he can change us into a donkey. And if he doesn't do that, that again, it's the grace of Allah, Taala, his compassion, his mercy towards his creation. So adab have to be observed, as it was mentioned in the, uh, in the previous session, that it is an ongoing investment. Every one of us has to work on it, keep on working on it. And then a point will come when we will be able to understand uh, or get a gloomy understanding of what this salat is and how a person can stand before Allah Taala in worship. Now again, if we see, it is the the karam or the greatness, the generosity of the Almighty Allah who has allowed us to be uh, present before Him, to stand before Him. Otherwise, we have no existence, nothing whatsoever. In numerous du'as, in so many ayat, that says that لا أملك لنفسي نفعا ولا ذرا ولا موتا ولا حياة ولا نشورا I am an existence who doesn't have anything, neither death nor life, then neither resurrection nor hayat. I don't have anything of my own, nothing, no existence of my own, no good, nothing. And then this, this person who is nothing and he is permitted and allowed to stand before someone who is everything, that all the existence is his, creation is his, benefactor, it is him, creator, it is him, provider, it is him, sustainer, it is him. With such a, before such a, an existence, we are permitted and allowed to stand. That is that height of greatness of Allah, the Ta'ala. So to perform a better service, we have to understand our own uh, existence first, and then we may try to understand the greatness of his creation. The creator, it is impossible. In one of these ahadiths, the Zainab Attara, she is the lady who used to bring uh, fragrances and perfumes to the Prophet once in a month. And the best of perfumes she brought for the Prophet and he also wore them. One day this lady, she says to the Prophet that, how can I know God? In reply, the Prophet says, you cannot, but you can try to understand and perceive the greatness of his creation. And then the Prophet, he says that, gives an example, says, for example, this place that you are in, this desert that you are sitting in, this desert compared to yourself, how much is it? What is the size of it? Maybe the size of a ring flung into that desert. Now that ring, what existence does it have? Nothing in that huge, vast desert. That little ring has no existence. Now compare that desert to the world, to this planet. That desert also doesn't exist in that, in that entire earth. It's so minute compared to the vastness of this great creation. Now this earth compared to the next sky. This earth also compared to the next sky, it has no existence in that vast creation of the sky. And that compared to the second, compared to the third, compared to the seventh, none of them can be compared to the other. Now, with all that greatness that he has created, we compare ourselves, that is myself, in those eight skies, in those seven skies, not even a dot, not no existence whatsoever. So I, who is so weak, and in this grand creation of Allah, Taala, who has no existence, is permitted and allowed to stand before someone who is the creator of such a magnificent creation. Now, that is that greatness of the Almighty Allah, who says that you are permitted and to speak to me, to talk to me. So when we come to that point, now the other thought to us is that when you offer your prayers, offer them, for example, in a desert, in a meadow, in a big plain, uh, plain uh, land, 
where you find yourself and your minuteness and it is evident there. And then when you stand there, a better service can be provided. Now, people who, for example, if someone is afflicted with some kind of an illness, may Allah ta'ala grant shifa to every one of them and a complete cure be given and a hasten, hasten recovery be given to all of them, especially afflicted with the this new manufactured disease. Allah grant them shifa and a long age, inshallah. Now, this uh, person who is ill, who has lost his ability, for example, now when he stands before God, there he says that, uh, God, I'm ill. La mawtan wa la hayatan. And who is this God? That alladhi khalaqani wa huwa yahdini. How beautiful in that surah, Nuh, I think. He, it says that alladhi khalaqani fa huwa yahdini. He created me and then he guided me. Walladhi yut'imuni wa yasqini. He is he who feeds me and then nourishes me and quenches my thirst when I'm thirsty. When I fell ill, he gives me cure. He grants me cure. So we present ourselves before Allah, especially those who are ill. That, and that is why it is said in Riwayat that a person who is ill uh, he is closer to Allah Taala, and there uh, generally they say that pray for us for our well-being when the Prophet says it's the other way around that person who was ill he should be praying for those for others because his du'as they are granted quicker because he is so close to Allah due to that illness and that mishap that he is going through so that weakness has to be presented before Allah. And Allah loves that a person, he has come to me, he has humbled before me, he has bowed down in sajda before me. And that is that height of uh, weakness of mind that I'm portraying before someone who is all great. Allahu Akbar, so many times we repeat in Adhan, in Iqama, in the prayers, all the way we sing Allahu Akbar, greatness is his, weakness is mine. Everything is his, nothing is mine. So that is that constantly I admit, and a person who constantly admits he is weak before Allah, ta'ala, a better service can be performed. Imam Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam, regarding the etiquettes and the adab of salat, he says that alayka bid iqbal ala salatika fa innama yahsabu laka minha ma aqbalta alayh. Imam says, Get work on the these prayers. Work on them such that they are accepted. Because that what is accepted from that salat, it's only those parts that are accepted by Allah Taala. From the entire salat, it isn't as such very fortunate and very lucky. Maybe someone that maximum or the most part of his prayer is accepted. So for us, the prayers that we offer, they are weak. But then even in those weak prayers, we have hope that there is going to be something that Allah, he will accept. Now this person was asked repeatedly, Marhum Ayatullah Bajad, he says that uh, someone comes and asks a similar question that what do I do? That our attention is always wandering in our prayers. He in reply says, now this is, uh, we've got an ayah in Quran that says, Rabbi adkhilni mudkhala sidq wa akhrijni mukhraja sidq. That Allah enter me a truthful entering and then bring me out and, uh, and, and exit me. That also should be truthful. So my entering and embarking into a task should be truthful and for God and sincere and my disembarking or exiting from that task also has to be for God. Now, in the tafsir of this, Ayatollah Ibn Jawadi Ahmadi, he used to say, he is of this opinion that every task of mine, it is, or every moment of mine, uh, whatever I do, it's made of so many moments. Now, these moments also, uh, I enter into a moment 
I come out of a moment. And that's how this time is also passing. So there is an uh, entering into a moment and then coming out from that moment. Again, entering into another moment, coming out from the other moment. So adkhilni mudkhala sibqin, adkhilni is there, entering is there, and then there is an exit from that moment as well. So here in this hadith, in this ayah says, my entering into that moment should be truthful, and then coming out also should be truthful. Now generally, people when they enter into a task, they are truthful, that haq is there, they want to serve, whatever. But then once we get into that task, coming out of that task, it is not for God. We don't want to leave that task, that action, that job, whatever that is. So here says entering should be for him, also exiting should be for him. Dukhul also should be for him, khuruj also should be for him. So moments also they are made like that. Here Ayatollah Bahjad, he says that, that prayers that we offer, so many pop-ups are there in our prayers, so many different thoughts are there. And among all of these pop-ups that we have in our prayers, there might be some moments when there are no pop-ups and then we are focused and we are connected. And then says that you just take that moment that you are connected to God and then continue your prayer with that moment. That is, you, you get help from that moment when you are connected to the existence of Allah. So these moments that we have in our prayers, when we are connected to him, are the moments that will be accepted by him. The other moments, no. So it is a scary situation and we also have to work on these moments and then this salat that we offer should be for the existence of Allah Jalla wa Allah. Now, there are things that help in performing a better service. One of them, before you start your prayers, brush your teeth. That is washing our mouth, rinsing our mouth, freshening ourselves. That is mustahab. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam, he had five toothbrushes. And every toothbrush was named Fajr, Zuhur, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. And the height of hygiene was such that before every salat of his, that miswak was used. And with that miswak, he performs his worship, his prayers. So here says that, that is one of the mustahabbat that will help you with your prayer. It is miswak, that is brushing your teeth. Among those mustahabbat that help perform a better service is combing your hair before you, brushing your hair and beard before you stand in worship. And likewise, wearing the best of clothes, the clear, cleanest of clothes that you have, and then wearing a perfume, all of these mustahabbat or these attachments that we have, they help us perform a better service. Now, all of this has to be done before the time of that salat, it enters. Now, among the mustahabbat that are highly recommended, it is the azan and the iqama. Azan, you, you recite that before the prayer. Immediately after that, you recite the iqama. Hadith says that when you recite an azan before your prayer, a stretch of angel, a suff of angels stands behind you and the stretch of that it's from the east of this creation to the west how many million or billion angels are there we don't know that many angels will be with you in your prayers if you recite an adhan and then says if you top it up with an iqama another stuff of angels will be with you and that is two safs, two rows of angels stretch east of the creation to the west, that many will join you in your worship, in your salat. So again here, hadith says that, and it's the ruling of the ulama as well. If you just started your present, you were reminded that you forgot to say your adhan, you can, uh, you can redo your salat, say the adhan, Aniqama and then start. But if you intentionally did not want to recite the Azan Aniqama and you did not recite it and you started your prayers here, you cannot uh, undo and redo the prayers. No. If it was by forgetfulness that you did not recite the Azan Aniqama, you are given that opportunity to redo the Azan and start the prayers again. Hadith says, إذا أذن بالأذان فتحت أبواب السماء 
was tajiba dua. Now prayer, salat, it means dua. That is, we are whispering to Allah, the Baraka wa Ta'ala. And somehow we want to get connected to him. And all the way through in this journey that we have, in this suluk that we have, we want to get closer to Allah, the Baraka wa Ta'ala, and a point will come and you will feel and you will see for yourself that you are closer to him, to the existence of Allah, the Baraka wa Ta'ala. The hadith that was just recited says, the moment a person, he, the moment when the azan is recited, the doors of the skies open and du'as, they are accepted. So there are three, uh, you can say three ihtimalat uh, or three possibilities of what does it mean over here that when the azan is recited, it is, is it the azan that is recited, for example, to inform people it is the time for prayer? Or no, it's just a random azan. Like, for example, a baby was born and you recited an azan for the baby. Or is it both of them? That azan that you recited, it is to inform people and also at the same time as an action. So whichever you take, you can, all three of them can be the applicable over here says when you recite the azan, what happens is shaitan, he flees. Shaitan, he runs away. Because that azan, now how much does he run away? Another hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he says, إِذَا نُوذِيَ بِالسَّلَاةِ أَدْبَرَ الشَّيْطَانِ فِي مَا بَيْنَ الرَّوْحَا حَتَّى لَا يَسْمَعْ سَوْتَ التَّأْذِينِ Beautiful, this hadith says. says, when the call of the prayers, they are announced, that you wanted to say your prayers, you stood, you recited the azan. Says, the moment you recite that azan, shaitan, he flees away, and a distance which is in tens of kilometers. Zoha, it's the place between Mecca and Medina says, you recite an azan here in Mecca, he runs away all the way to Zoha, which is tens of kilometers towards Medina. And then he flees to not hear the call of the azan. And the doors, when you recite the azan, the doors of the skies, they open, and the doors of the uh, heaven also, they have opened, and then your du'as, they get accepted. So this azan of yours, it is one of those stepping stones that Allah has given to you where your du'as, they are accepted. So when you recited the azan, immediately if you have any hajat, any du'a, have that du'a presented before Allah, the Baraka wa ta'ala, and it will be granted. So all the way through, you see that in this salat, we've recited, we, we, we have prepared ourselves way before the time of the salat enters. Wudu has been done, we've brushed our teeth, we've applied that fragrance, we've dressed ourselves, the prayer mat is ready, and all these are the muqaddimat that we have availed for the salat, and now the azan I recited. Immediately after that, uh, that azan, whatever dua you have, present it before Allah, because that is the best of times that you are connected to Allah. Jalla wa ala. And then iqama is there. In the iqama, إِذَا كَانَ عِنْدَ الْأَذَانِ فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ وَاسْتُجِيبَ الدُّعَى When it's the azan, the skies, the, its door, their doors, they open, du'as are accepted. Now when you recite the iqama, what happens? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he says that, وَإِذَا كَانَ عِنْدَ الْإِقَامَ When you recite the iqama, لَمْ تُرَدْ دَعْوَةً That Dua that you had, it will not be denied. It will not be rejected. So initially, after the azan, you presented your duas, and then after the iqama, it's been reconfirmed that it has been accepted, and it will be granted to you. So here, just like those seventy-two hours reconfirmation we used to have when we used to travel. And if you don't, then it would be cancelled. Here it says that the moment you've done the iqama, that it has been reconfirmed and that dua of yours also will be granted. 
So it's beautiful. Azan is there and then Iqama is there. Now a person, he comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and says, Ya Rasulullah, inna al-mu'adhaneen yafdaluna a mu'adhan who recites the azan, is he uh, of a higher rank and is he excelled over us? Does he have any excellence? فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ قُلْ كَمَا يَقُولُونَ فَإِذَا انْتَهَيْتَ فَاسْأَلْ تُعْتَى So it's just like him. You also recite the azan, whatever you ask, you, you ask also will be given to you. So certain designations are, go, are great, like the muazzin who recites the azan, like the imam who read, leads the prayers, so on and so forth. And one more thing is that when an opportunity is given, avail that opportunity and Quran says khayrat. when it comes to doing good you rush go ahead and do that if you can recite the azan recite it because all these we don't know which of uh, these actions of ours will be accepted by Allah Taala. so getting ready slowly and we are embarking on this salat and then one of the things that can really help whilst you are performing the wuzu, and then when you are reciting the azan within your heart, or even you can say, Ya sahib az-zaman, adrikni, imam help me, imam help me. That continuous tawassul to the imam be there, that you are constantly asking him to help. And that tawassul also helps. It says before the azan, you say, Ya sahib az-zaman, adrikni. And then after the azan, you have your du'as. Again, before iqama, you say, Ya sahib az-zaman, adrikni. And what du'as should you have after the azan and the iqama? We have various du'as for, for, for the wuzu, for example. And then we have du'as for the azan and the iqama as well. One of the du'as that you have after you've recited the azan, it's Allahumma ja'al qalbi darran wa rizqi darran. وَأَوْلَادِي أَبْرَارًا وَجْعَلْنِي أَنْ دَقَبْرِ نَبِيكَ مُسْتَقَرًا وَقَرَارًا which uh, you may be, you have memorized it, you may have heard it and it's one of those beautiful du'as when we ask Allah Taala to say that اللَّهُمَّ جَعَلْ قَلْبِي بَارًا and give me a good heart and then وَرِزْقِي دَارًا and my sustenance, my rizq, Allah may it continue and may it pour down وَعَمَلِي قَارًا And the actions that I'm performing, Allah, make those actions firm and strong. وَجْعَلْنِي عِنْدَ قَبْرِ نَبِيِّكَ مُسْتَقَرًا وَقَرَارًا And Allah, by the grave of the Prophet, keep me firm with the Prophet. And then with the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as-salam, مُسْتَقَرًا وَقَرَارًا Now, <clears throat> these times that we have for prayers, they are the best of times. Allah, he has designed Salat in such a way that you've got your Fajr, you've got your Zuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. And these prayers that we offer, they keep on forgiving the wrong that we have done between those two times of prayers. Hadith says that when we commit a wrong, a sin has been done by us, says a seven hour grace period is given to that angel who records the wrong of mine, and it is said to him that if he repents, don't record, don't register, don't mark the action report with a negative mark. Seven hours is given. If he says Astaghfirullah, and it will not be written. Now, what the other beauty that we see in this Salat is that Fajr, I did, I did some wrong, and I forgot to repent, and then it's time for Zohr. When I say my Zohr prayers, that is with on that. Uh, within that time and uh, because the, the prayer timings also if you see there's an average seven hour distance between every salat between fajr and maghrib fajr and zuhr and then between zuhr and maghrib it's about seven hours of distance that we have between two prayers so that again allah has designed and created in a way that the servant who has stood before him in worship he is constantly forgiven he's all the way he's being forgiven by Allah Taala, the Prophet once again he says, "Warfau ilayhi aydiyakum bidduga." That is, you raise your hands before Him, that is God, for your duas when fi awqati salatikum. That is when it is time for your prayers. For inna afdalus saat, 
because Allah, he has created these prayers in the best of times, just like uh, the, uh, the best of times for certain jobs that you want to get to. So is there's, uh, or for example, even Amal that you want to get yourself granted 15th of Shaban, it's such a beautiful day, 27th of Rajab, such a beautiful occasion, Laylatul Qadr. So these timings that we have all, all year round, some of them, they are ex ex exclusively great. Just like that, Allah, in these 24-hour clock that he has created, says Salat has been placed in the best of locations and points of these 24-hour clock. So raise your hands in dua during the times of your prayers as they are the best of times. What happens that time? Says, Yanzur Allah Azza wa Jal fiha bir rahma. The Almighty, he, will, he looks at his servants with mercy. And then says, Yujibuhum idha najaw, wa yulabbihim idha nadaw. He replies to them when they whisper to him, He, that is the Creator, God, says labbaik to his creation, the servant when he calls upon him. That is, you say, Ya Allah, Allah says labbaik to you. That is that height of greatness of his that he has come to you. Says that when a person has done wrong and he says, Astaghfirullah, Allah forgives. But someone who has been a sinner, who has done a lot of wrong, when he says, Allah, Allah says labbaik to him twice. Just like these accident and emergency units, the a &E, when you go there, you've got different patients who have come. Some of them, they are heavily wounded. And some of them, they are mild, they are light, then they have an emergency, but it's not as acute as the, uh, the other person who's bleeding heavily. So this staff in the a &E, they give priority to that person who is heavily wounded and is bleeding and is fatal. Allah Taala works in a similar way, multiplied by infinity, towards a sinner, towards a wrongdoer, towards someone who has repented and who has returned to Allah Taala. Just like that person who is heavily wounded and is fatal, and when he has come to the A&E, all the staff, they get together to save that one person. Like that, Allah also says labbaik to everyone, but someone who has returned to him after a lot of sinning and wrongs is labbaik to him twice because he is in need of help a lot more than others. And when they call him and accept when they supplicate to him, the Almighty. Now, Adhan is recited and then the Iqama is recited and then du'as, they are accepted at the time of Adhan and Iqama. So, so far, it's all these different occasions that Allah has created. That is, prior to your starting your prayers, now that you've recited the Adhan, another opportunity for you to get connected to Him via du'a. After the Iqama, again, another opportunity for you to get connected to Him via du'a. Alaykum bid du'a fi adbar is salat fa inna mustajab. Then says, once you've completed your prayer, again, one dua of yours is definitely going to be granted. Whatever you can, you have, you can present. And then says, one of them will definitely be granted. In addition to all of these other duas that you have. It doesn't mean that he's going to accept only one. No, it says one will 100% be granted uh, uh, for after your prayers. Between the Azan and the Iqama, after the Azan, it's the same. And then it says that, Allah, we start uh, concentrating with tawajjuh unto him, the Almighty, from the Azan and the Iqama, and then the Takbiratul Ihram is recited. Now, when we say this, uh, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar is repeated um, four times in the Azan, twice in Iqama, and then you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, you're giving that testimony that I bear witness that he is one and there is no one besides him. I bear and give that testimony that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is the apostle and the 
Rasul of Allah wa ta'ala. And again, I say that Ana ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah wa aktafi bihima amman aba wa jahada wa ayyina bihima man aqarra wa shahida. So I'm constantly giving this testimony to Allah that I am connected to you. The program that you have sent, I have acknowledged it and I abide by that program. So after the azan also, whatever you want, you can have the du'as that you have. <clears throat> and there are various du'as. Uh, the most famous is the one I recited, Allahumma ja'al qalbi barran, so, uh, until the end. And one of the <clears throat> other du'as that you have that you can recite after the azan uh, or the iqama is Allahumma rabba da'wati tamma wa salati al-qa'ima a'ti muhammadan su'lahu yawm al qiyama that is god who has given this invitation this da'wah this perfect complete and this salat also that has been uh, established a'ti muhammadan su'lahu whatever the prophet asks allah give him give it to him on the day of judgment wa ballighhu darajat al wasila and allah grant prophet muhammad that daraja the rank of that intercession and wasila and accept his intercession, his mediation, his shafaat for his nation. So these are the du'as that you can have. If you don't know these du'as, then whatever du'a you want, you can perform. One of the other ways is that some people, and this is also Muslim, we have in riwayat, some people observe it, that once you've recited the azan, bow down in sajda and say, Rabbi, that God to you I perform this sajda with all humbleness and with all fear and with all then let I bow down before you that is that khudu and that khushu that I observe after reciting the azan so this azan that is recited or this uh, salat that we are offering, it is the ascension of a mu'min in the open skies of spirituality. And in this open skies of spirituality that a mu'min has come towards Allah, wa ta we have to come to him with a... With a We have to come to him with a sincere heart, with a qalb that is salim, sincere heart. And here, one of the, I'll just quote this incident and we'll conclude today's session. Marhum Ardishir. Now this is one of the noble personalities living about 30, 35 years ago, he passed away. And it is the Marja'iyat of Marhum Ayatullah al Uzma Mar'ashi Najafi. He used to lead the prayers, all five of them, as long as he was alive. And he passed away in 1996, 1990, yeah, late in the late 90s. And offers his Maghrib prayers in the Haram. He goes home, he has a massive heart attack, and he passes away at the age of around 98 years. Now, during this time, there was a person living in Qom. His name was Marhum Ardishire. And he did not have a house to live in. In the summer, he used to live by the, uh, outside the haram of Hazrat Ma'asuma, alayhi salam. And in winter, there is a graveyard, a cemetery near the haram. It's called Shaykhan, opposite Faizia. There are rooms around that uh, graveyard. He used to go in one of these hujras, one of the chambers. Now all those chambers also, they are graves of mu'mineen. He used to sleep there in those rooms. Now, home construction in those days, the, room, the, the doors and the windows, they were made of iron. And iron also in uh, winter, it expands. So the doors, they become bigger and they become stiffer and it becomes difficult to open and close. Now this person is called Ardishire because uh, his entire living throughout his life, what he used to eat is just bread with some sesame seed syrup. Sometimes the sesame seed halwa. It's bread and sesame seed syrup or just bread and sesame seed halwa. Sometimes both of them. 
Now in the winter, he was in the room and very muqaddas, very uh, noble he was. Now, the other thing that in the construction of Qum is that uh, the walls, they are made of chalk and lime. Chalk and lime also, it's one of those uh, minerals on which you cannot perform tayammum. Tayammum has to be either dust or clay or earth or part of the earth, not on chalk and lime. Now he was in that room, it was winter, it uh, snowed heavily. And as a result of that cold weather, the doors of that room, that chamber he was in, they got expanded. He got locked up in that graveyard, in that room. No one is there. It's time for Salam. He wakes up. He wants to perform wuzu. He cannot go out. The room is locked. And it's getting closer to the uh, to getting qaza. He cannot perform tayammum. No water, no dust, because it's all made of chalk and lime. And there is nothing to perform tayammum on. Before the Salat gets qaza, he says, God, I've been thankful to you throughout my life. You gave me, I was thankful. Sometimes you gave me ard noon, noon with ardashire, with the sesame seed syrup and halwa. I was happy. Sometimes without it, I was happy. Sometimes it was only bread. I was happy. And I was fit and well. I performed prayers throughout my life, sometimes with wuzu, sometimes with ghosl, sometimes with tayammum, and I did all of them. This time, because I'm locked up and I cannot do anything, I cannot perform a wuzu, neither there is anything to perform a tayammum here. I'm going to offer this prayer without wuzu, without tayammum, and you, the gracious, the Rahman, the Rahim, you accept it from me. He offers his prayers without wuzu and tayammum because he could not. And then he dies, Ayatollah Marashi Najafi, he reveals that after his death, when I saw him, he's been blessed with such a high rank, with so many, so much of bestowals granted unto him. And I said to him, maybe it's because of the patience and that tolerance he had, the tough time and uh, he had throughout his life, that Allah has given to him as a, uh, as a reward for all that patience. He says, no. That's not for that. For that, he's given something else. Whatever you see now, whatever he has given to me now, it's because of that salat that I offered without wuzu and without taharat and with all that sincerity and ikhlas. That qalb salim has to be there. That sincerity has to be there. And that is what Allah accepts. Now, don't take this wrong and offer prayers without wuzu and tayammum. That is not being mentioned over here. He could not do that wuzu. He could not perform. But it was that sincere action of his that Allah accepted and give, granted and gave him all of that. We talked about wuzu. We talked about tayammum, about adhan. We talked about iqama. And tonight it is the night of the shahadat of Hazrat Fatima, salamullahi alayha. After the <clears throat> demise of the Apostle of Allah. And then we see that how much of a tragedy unfolded on this pure house of Wahi, that to a house where Allah gave so much of respect and honor, the Prophet who used to come and stand there by the house of Ali and Zahra, and he used to respect them. Jibreel would never enter, but that stand by that. Uh, entrance and then get permission from Rasulullah and then enter to that place. That house was disrespected. That house was dishonored. That door was burnt down and Hazrat Fatima, she was heavily wounded and Mohsin was killed in that, in that attack that took place in Medina. Since the demise of Rasulullah, Bilal the Mu'azzin of the Prophet, he stopped reciting the Adhan. And then it was here that Hazrat Fatima says that Bilal, I remember the Azan of yours during the time of my father. And I want you to recite that Azan. And upon the command of Hazrat Fatima, Bilal, he comes and he's on the Ma'zana and starts reciting the Azan. The moment he said, Allahu Akbar, this cry of Hazrat Fatima also started. فَلَمَّا قَالَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرْ ذَكَرَتْ أَبَاهَا وَأَيَّامَهُ فَلَمْ تَتَمَالَكْ مِنَ الْبُكَى She was reminded of the days of her father. And then she could not control her cries and she could not not cry. She burst into cries. 
the moment Bilal said, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, Shahakat Fatima, was Sakatat Livajheha at Fatima. She, she burst into cries, she fainted, she fell on her face. Now, here the women there in Medina, they said Bilal stopped the Azan as Fatima, her soul has departed. And they come to Fatima and they recover her. She gains consciousness and says, Bilal, continue with the Azan. Bilal comes and says, Lady Zahra, allow me not to recite the Azan. And I can, as I cannot see the state and, that you are in, with your permission, allow me not to. And she also permits and allows him to not continue with the Azan. وأمتنا ممات محمد وآل محمد اللهم ارزقنا في الدنيا زيارة محمد وآل محمد وفي الآخرة شفاعة محمد وآل محمد الله count us all among the مسلين among those who keep up and establish prayers those who are with prayers and Allah our children our descendants our, our generations to come Count us among the best of Muslims, hasten in the return of our Imam, our Master, and Shahadat be given to every one of us. Wajir fi faraji Maulana Sahib al Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajikum. I wanted to thank Maulana on behalf of women, behalf of our community, on, behalf, on my behalf for giving us such an amazing informative lecture on adab -e salat inshallah may we all benefit from the words and be able to implement what we have learned here today i wanted to also announce that our q a portion is being started right now so anyone who has questions for molana please post them on the youtube link in the comment section where you are viewing so we may ask the questions While we are waiting, I have a question of my own, if I may ask Mulan. Bismillah. So I have, I've read on multiple ways on how to constantly improve our focus and my focus in namaz and prayer, like focusing on the translations of what I'm saying of the dhikr of namaz. Is there more ways that I'm able to improve the focus on the prayer so that sajda i sahaf and salat al are not needed? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, now, salat and salat ihtiyat and sajda isab and all that, if it's uh, sometimes, even if you are focusing so much, it, it can happen in two ways. Either you are totally disconnected, there you need that salat ihtiyat and sajda isab. Sometimes you are so much drowned and connected, then also this may happen that you just lose the count of the prayers that you are so much drowned and focused in your prayers. So it might be either of the two situations that, that may emerge in our prayers. Now, for that salah to serve uh, the, uh, how to focus more, there are different ways, inshallah, we'll continue and talk on this as we go ahead. Now, <clears throat> one of the ways it's by trying to understand the meanings of the, uh, of the ayat the meanings of the azkar, the recitals that you are reciting. Now, how does that happen? <clears throat> so initially, your recitation has to be complete, has to be correct. And then you know a little bit of what the meanings of these sentences. And like, for example, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, that all praise belongs to the Lord of the worlds. So like that, you, you try to know the meaning of the entire surahs. So when you want to say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, it could be like having, uh, you're saying something in Arabic with your tongue, 
at the same time, there is a subtitle that is moving within you. That all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the merciful, the compassionate. Not that you have to say that, no. You don't say, you just say the Arabic. So you're trying to understand that in your own language, whatever that language is. So it's like these subtitles that are going with you. So initially, if, for example, reciting this Surah Al-Hamd takes about 40 seconds of my time or one minute of my time, with the meanings that I'm trying to understand, it may take a little longer. It may take a minute and 30 seconds because I'm going slowly and trying to understand the ayat as well. So that will be a little slower. So when I'm trying to understand that salat, when I bow down in ruku, I say, Subhana Rabbi al azimi wa bihamdih. And then try to present myself before the Almighty God and with such humbleness. And that humbleness also we see in riwayat, like for example, when a hen or even a dog, when the dog sits with the, in front of its master, you see how those paws have been stretched outwards. That is that height of humbleness he is portraying before his master. That is how he has presented himself. Or sometimes the wings of the hen also, when it lowers before, <clears throat> then it says that way you present yourself before God, that you have nothing. I don't have anything on my own. So that gradual and a slow process. So out of these five prayers that you have throughout the day, one of these prayers that you have, <clears throat> one of these prayers that you have uh, during the day, one of those prayers, you can give him importance. To, uh, a more, more, you may feel that you are, you are better connected. It's, maybe it's Fajr, maybe it's Maghrib, maybe it's Zohar, whichever we do not know. So that is something that we have to work on and see which of the prayers. Um, generally, it may be the Fajr prayers. It is the shortest of all of these prayers. And you may be better connected because there is less distraction throughout the day. Yep. <clears throat> As we wait for more questions, I'll, I'll take some short time to make the announcements for the following program for tomorrow, and the day after. So tomorrow we will have the program for the Shahadat and commemoration of Bibi Fatima the Zahra Salam Alayha. The program will start at 7.30 p.m. with the recitation of the Holy Quran, followed by Sol Salam in Marcia. Then we will have Sheikh Bilal Hussein from Virginia to give a speech in English. The program will end with Noha and Ziyarat. On Sunday, the 17th, we'll have another program commemorating the Shahadat of Bibi Fatimta Zahra Salam Alayha. The program will start at 7.30 again with the recitation of Holy Quran. We will have reciters from around the world reciting So Salam Marcia and Noha. And our Majlis will be in Urdu by Mulana Ghulam Raza Ruhan from Pakistan. Mumay, if you have any questions, please, for Malana, please type them in on the YouTube link that you're viewing. It will be in the comment section. Please post them in the comment section below, and then we'll be able to ask the questions to Malana, and we'll be able to receive the answers. While we are waiting, I have another question for you, Malana. Yes, sir. I have, I have read, or I've heard in lectures sometimes, that uh, when doing Salat al-Layl, that if you have qada prayers, so instead of doing the eight rakat, you could replace them with the qaza prayers, or sometimes if you have qada prayers, then you should do those instead of doing the eight rakat. Is there any such rule that you're not allowed to do the eight rakats and then the one rakat for salat If you have qaza prayers? Yes. No, there's no such rule. Uh, for, the for the fast, we do have that if you have wajib fasts outstanding, 
So whatever fast you will observe, it will be counted as the wajib that you have done. For fast there is, but for salat, no. Now that again, it's something that people, they do say, yeah, if the prayers are so many that he has nothing, no, no other time slot, then that's another situation. But generally that, should, that may not be the case. But when it comes to Salatul Layl, uh, and uh, for example, they try to get some time out. It doesn't take a lot of time. Many a times you find there are excuses that come from Shaitan to put away people <clears throat> from that Salatul Layl. Because Salatul Layl, it's that special fast track. Special fast track, when a person observes it only for those uh, for that special time. Uh, and it is that time when a person gets all what he wants. There, one of the mystics that we have is Marhum Ayatollah Qazi Tabatabai. He is the Ustad of Ayatollah uh, Muhammad Hussain Tabatabai, the author of Tafsir al Mizan, Ustad of Ayatollah Bajat. All these great personalities he's been the Ustad of. He says that even if it is uh, to have a cup of tea, get up, sit at the time of that is pre-dawn, pre-fajr, sit and have a cup of tea. Don't miss out that time. It is that special time of all barakat that a person can get to. And by having these excuses that I've got wajib prayers, so I will not do the, uh, the night prayers, all these are lame excuses. Mostly they are casted by uh, Iblis, that the, yeah, you have wajib prayer, so you don't do them, and then you just do your wajib first, and then when you get time, you do your night prayers. Now, night prayers, at least the two and the one, the shaf and the water, do those two. It won't take more than three minutes. In those three minutes, how many qaza prayers can you do? So mostly it's these excuses that we have. If you give importance to that night prayers, and then you want to do those prayers, and also your Fajr prayers, you'll be given more opportunities and tawfiqat to get those outstanding wajib qaza done quicker. So we have gotten a question. The question is, is it okay to use a rakat counter for sajda? Yeah, you can. You can use a rakat counter if there's any other way, uh, uh, any other digital way. You've got something new created that will help you maintain the count of the rakat, yeah, you can use it. <clears throat> okay, so we have another question. So it is about the Salat al-Wutr and Salat al-Shafa. If it's nearing the time of the Azan of the Fajr prayers, are you still allowed to pray those prayers? Uh, well, Salat al-Fajr, the time enters from that time of Fajr. For example, today here, the Fajr is around 6.08. So that is the time when your night prayers uh, that will go qaza. But if you've started your water prayer and you're still in that water and it's uh, and you're towards the end, that's fine. You can continue with that. And then you can say your fajr prayers immediately after that. Not that you are going to stretch it too long. For example, you are already occupied and it's time for fajr now. You say your fajr prayers and then you, uh, uh, yeah, you can, but not, if you've missed them, then you can do them qaza. We have another question. The question is, how would a person handle the feeling of not praying? Because sometimes it happens. Not praying. How can you handle the feeling of not praying? Yes. Yeah. Well, all these are satanic traps that you get. Uh, that is the first thing how shaitan, he wants to attack a person. It's by making prayer weak, making it zaif, making it something very easy. 
And we do have all these riwayat from Ma'sumin alayhi salam. One of them is from Hazrat Fatima, salamullahi alayha, where she says, where she says that there are 15 punishments for someone who takes prayers easy. Not that he doesn't offer his prayers. Not offering prayers, it's, sheer, it's, a, it's a great sin. But here, taking prayers easy is that not performing those prayers as they ought to be, have, they, they should be performed. That is uh, uh, taking prayers easy. Now, sometimes if you have that feeling, uh, you get refuge in Allah, Jalla wa'ala, ask him to help, to have that feeling away from us. And that can be, that help can be sought uh, by performing a wuzu, quickly go and perform a wuzu, and then ask him to help. One of the other ways to help over there is that when you're performing the first wuzu of your day and you want to say the prayers, Whilst performing that, you re repeat Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim 19 times. I'm offering my wuzu and say those Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim 19 times. That will give you an extra protection uh, for the entire day, an extra nuraniyat that will help oust and put away Iblis from that. So these thoughts that come to our mind regarding prayers, we have to keep on uh, removing them. And you will not get to a stage of yaqeen unless you have passed a phase of doubts. So no one can get to that yaqeen unless he has passed through doubts. So these doubts will be casted and the stronger you make yourself in pushing away these doubts to, to that yaqeen and certainty you will get. So it's fine. We may have those thoughts that why should we pray? Why should we give an importance to salat? All those things will come to our, to our mind. There will be an age in life. Such questions will come regarding the imams, regarding the prophets, regarding the infallibility, regarding prayers, regarding the Quran. Doesn't matter, let them come. You go to someone who is sincere, who can help you answer those questions, and then you will get them removed and you will get stronger in your faith. Inshallah. We have another question. The question is, do we have to do zakat this year? in the current situation? And what if the person has lost their job during the pandemic? Yeah, well, zakat and khums, they are become wajib on a person uh, when there is an X amount of saving uh, during the end of the year. For example, my zakat year, uh, it's the 31st of December, for example. So there I come and see that how much have I made money, have I earned or have I lost? If I've gained something during that year, and for zakat, uh, generally zakat doesn't apply to you and me. Zakat applies to farmers, uh, applies to people who have these live crops like sheep and camel and cattle, etc. If they have it, and it has, for example, you've got 40 camels, you give away one as the zakat. You've got 40 cows, you give away one as the zakat. Or if it's crops, then 2.5% of the income that you have made of 5%, depending on how the land was irrigated. So it's quite uh, complex and zakat is also not too much. So if you've gained something as homes or zakat, you have to pay, whether it's little or whether it is a lot. And someone who gives homes and zakat, uh, the prophet, he has promised the imams, they have said that we will return whatever you pay as the homes, for example, in 17 folds, it will come back to you. So it has got that barakat that is given. And so in Islam, wealth grows by giving, not by holding. It's the other way around, the calculations that we have. Thank you, Mulana. Thank you. Wait for, we'll wait two to three minutes. If there's any last minute questions, the Q&A will be ending shortly, Mominin. So if you have any questions, please ask them on the comment section.
So Mulana, we have one last question. The question is, what if, it, what if I cannot pray because my parents do not allow me to? Yeah, this is something that we have, have to work on. We've got two commands here. There is a command of the Almighty God, and there is a command that is coming from the parents. If these two commands, they contradict, meaning that God is saying something and the parents, they are saying something. So here you'll have to take the word of the Almighty God. There says that la ta'ata lil makhluq fi ma'asiyat al khaliq when you, it, it's not obedience anymore. So it's not obedience towards the parents in that aspect. That the parents, they are asking you to disobey God. In disobedience to God, you don't obey your parents. No, with all due respect, you continue with being obedient to God and a time will come that they also will regret and they will come to know that you are right. So when there, whenever there is, a, or even between husbands, and then there's a command of God. If a husband says something to the wife, uh, which is disobedience to God, that, and she in obedience to him, you don't abide by that. You have, to be, uh, you have to abide by the obedience to God, that God says that you have to, for example, observe hijab, then you have to, because the husband is saying, so I have to put it away. No, it doesn't work that way. Or because of a father is saying, do not pray. And now God is saying, asking me to pray. I don't put away prayers because my parents are not happy with me praying. No. Whenever a, the command of God contradicts or comes against or in line uh, with the command of parents, their priority will be given to the command of Allah. Thank you, Mulana. Thank you, Mulana. If there is any last minute questions, we will be taking one more and we will end at 9.20. And we have amazing teachings over here. For example, during the time of Imam As-Sadiq uh, he is among the obedient uh, Muslims and companions and servants of Imam As-Sadiq He comes and says that my parents, they are old and they are Christians and I'm according to your sharia I follow what do I do what is my uh, the command to me imam says if wine is not in your house if they don't consume pork then you just be with them eat with them and those halal and haram rules that we have you abide by them stay with your parents although they are not happy with your islam you be with them the mother who is blind she after a time she says that uh, have you switched have you changed your religion um, the son says, why do you say that? The mother says that the practice that you have, the way you behave and believe with us and you practice are the teachings of Jesus, often the teachings of Prophet Isa. Here, the son says, yeah, I follow Imam As-Sadiq salam Says his teachings are exactly the same teachings as Prophet Isa has. And then she says that, teach me what he has taught you. Now the mother, initially they were Christians and then they, they, she finds out that he has embraced and says, okay, teach me what he has taught you. He teaches and says, teach me how he prays. And he, the son, teaches the mother how to offer prayers and she offers a Zohar prayers and she dies. So that is as a result of being uh, in obedience to God. It may be a tough ride, it may be a difficult time, but then you, for the sake of God, say, Qurbatan ilayk, God, I am abiding by your command, your instructions, you help me. And he will op open up all the doors and paths before you, and that is for obedience to him. Obedience is uh, important. <clears throat> that was absolutely beautiful. So we will be, and we got one last question. This will be the last question of the Q&A. The question is, is there anything I can do if I don't know how to pray and my parents won't allow me in my house? So, so since we answered the second part of the question already, we'll go to the first part of it. Is there anything I can do if I do not know how to pray? Well, to the new Muslims oh, who embrace, uh, first few days we don't force them, we don't ask them that they have to go and learn to pray. First of all, they have to be familiarized with the religion. They get to know. And then slowly, maybe five, six months later down the road, 
they learn to pray. If they don't know how to pray, then the teaching is that they offer prayers in jama'at where the recitation of the surahs is not required. The only thing they recite is that Allahu Akbar, they join in jama'at, they say their prayers. So that is how they can do. But whatever they can, they do whatever they can if they don't know how to. Thank you so much, Mulan. That is the last question. We will be ending the Q&A at this time. I wanted to thank Munana Heather Sharazi once again from, from on behalf of the Islamic Center of Moment and the community. It is always a pleasure of hearing your voice and gaining and attaining the knowledge that you have brought to us. Inshallah, we're able to implement it all and we're able to continue the series uh, very shortly in the upcoming days. Sure. I hope you all enjoyed it. I wanted to thank everyone for attending today. And Jazakallah Khair. وسبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين فر المؤمنين المؤمنات الفاتحة مع السلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد If there's a doubt in your qaza prayers, minimum and maximum, three months or five months. So you do the three months, three years or five years. You just do the three years and the rest will be okay, inshallah. So always take the minimum side and do it. And Allah, he is opt forgiving, merciful, and he will accept. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Mulan. Thank you so much, Mulan. Thank you so much, Mulan.